I'm Eric Marcus, and this is a special bonus episode of Making Gay History. The sixth season of our podcast is focused on LGBTQ activism in the post-Stonewall 70s. Two of the most prominent trans activists to emerge out of that period were Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson. In 1970, the year after the Stonewall Uprising in New York City's Greenwich Village, the two friends founded Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, or STAR, and set up a bare-bones refuge in a rundown apartment building on the Lower East Side of Manhattan for street kids much like themselves. They called it Star House. In December 1970, Liza Cowan, a 20-year-old reporter for WBAI Radio, conducted what we believe is the oldest recorded interview with Sylvia, Marsha, and other members of STAR. She used a reel-to-reel tape recorder and set out to do a story on what was then known as cross-dressing. Eventually, a single reel containing an edited version of the interview found its way into the basement of the Lesbian Her Story archives in Brooklyn, New York. And that's where Making Gay History's self-described archive rat, Brian Faree, found it in the spring of 2019. Before we share some of that incredibly rare tape with you, I thought I'd ask Brian about his experience of discovering this long-lost interview. How did you find this tape? Where were you and what were you doing? So I was looking for audio for the fifth season of Making Gay History for our Stonewall season. And my mission was to find archival audio tapes that were made around 1968 to 1971. So I went to the LGBT Center archives, I went to the New York Public Library, and I went to the Lesbian Her Story archives. In the basement of the Lesbian Her Story archives, I was going through all of their cassettes for WBAI shows. I didn't find anything that reached back that was applicable to what we were looking for. But out of the corner of my eye in the basement, I saw a box of open reel open reel audio, which is an older style of audio recording than cassettes would be. So what is, can you describe what open reel uh, uh, recording is? Is it like, is it what you see in the movies or in in photographs, an actual reel of tape? Yes, these are the big reels. These Uh are like, well, three inch, five inch, seven inch, 10 inch. And I didn't know what was in this box when I saw it, but I went upstairs to the volunteer archivist, Rachel Corbman, and I asked her if I could go through it. And right there in the middle of the box, I pulled out this recording that was labeled Star. I was afraid to open it because some of these tapes, they're so fragile when they're 50, 60, 70 years old. They are so fragile that you can destroy them. And I know how difficult it is to get archival material surrounding Star. Yeah. So what did you th- when you saw this? Besides being afraid that you would you could possibly damage the tape, um, I mean, it's almost like finding the Holy Grail. You know, you want to listen to it immediately when you find a tape like that, and you can't. Why couldn't you just play it? Well, for one, there are some tapes that, as you play it, they will erase when they're fifty years old. So you will listen to it, but nobody else will. So if you want to have a tape digitized like that, what do you do? We took the tape to a studio in Harlem called Swan Studios that specializes in this type of digitization. I took so much care when I took it out of that building. I I was so afraid of damaging it. It was like I had $10,000 in my backpack and couldn't let anyone near it. So I arrived at Swan Studios in Harlem, and Robert, the sound engineer, started rewinding the tape. And when he did, every single manual edit snapped. Oh, my. So this is an edited, this was uh, an interview that was done that was then edited. and, and, And how did they edit tape? Well, they had to take it physically and slice it. And then with adhesive, glue it back together. So each and every time it hit one of these physical edits, it would snap. Which for me was terrifying But for him, it was just run-of-the-mill. He would just take the two ends, reapply adhesive, and keep rewinding it. Once he rewound it, what did he do next? Well, he was kind enough to let me sit in the studio and listen to it as he played it for the first time. And I knew I was listening to something very special. What made it special? It was special for me because they're not just talking about 
the organization that they created. They're also talking about their lives. And they're talking about how they see the world around them and how they see gender. It's all very personal. They're not all towing the same line. What did you take away from hearing that recording? I think it reminded me of how young everyone was then. I think the Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera that I've grown accustomed to, they were older by the time um, the film that I've seen of them, the video that I've seen of them, the recordings that I've listened to from them, they had more time under their belt. And this, it was, it was like they were freshly arrived in New York and just letting it all out. The quality of the tape you're about to hear in this remarkable and far-ranging conversation is a bit uneven. In addition to a snippet of Jefferson Airplane, you'll also notice hissing in the background during part of the discussion. Anyone who has ever lived in an old New York City apartment will recognize that sound. It's coming from the faulty valve of a steam heat radiator. The first person to speak is 19-year-old Sylvia Rivera. The second is someone named Victor, and the third is Marsha P. Johnson, who was 25 at the time. Before my mother passed away, like my first three years, my mother used to dress me in girls' clothes, and my mother, my grandmother, kept on buying like little blouses and girl slacks until about I was six or seven years old. Before I went into school, then she started dressing me in boys' clothes. During that period, that's when I discovered my homosexuality was, like, you know, watching television and placing myself in the role of the female or just placing myself as another, as another boy in the male's arm and, that, and the man that was playing such a fantastic love role in the television. <laughs> and um, I found when I left home, at 11 was really when I went into transvestism and makeup, um, hustling in the streets and the games, I guess, whatever you want to call them. My uh, experience is different from Sylvia's. I, I did it all secretly because uh, if my mother would catch me, she would forbid it. And um, by the time I was five years old, I knew enough that uh, uh, to do these things secretly. Uh, so I used to, when no one was around, to put on makeup and uh, uh, wear uh, women's clothes I can get my hands on. But otherwise, I grew up quite masculine. I went to school, I played baseball, I went to college, and so on. And um, I even grew a beard and was a revolutionary. I, I did time in jail for uh, and pacifist demonstrations. And... Um, just recently, uh, I, I decided, what, um, you know, why not wear the clothes I prefer to wear? Why, you know, I was, I was, uh, all this time I was living a masculine role that uh, I didn't really prefer. Or at least I didn't prefer to do it permanently. I preferred the times to be feminine. Um, women's lib people uh, feel that uh, women are forced to take certain roles which are unacceptable to them. And... Uh, they want to break out. Now, I've often felt the same way about being a man, that I've been forced to take certain roles. Uh, number one, something as, as unimportant as the clothes uh, I have to wear. Men's uh, Restrictions on men's dress are much more severe than the restrictions on women's dress. Um, men are forced to look a certain way, and I didn't want to look that way. Then, of course, there's the, a man has to... Uh, be tough, he has to have responsibility, he has to take care of people. You know, suppose I wanted to be uh, petted or I wanted to be taken care of. As I was growing up, I met a lot of men. But they never appealed to me, you know, too much sexually. I used to try and keep away from them because of my hometown. If you were homosexual, you were out of it. And they would call you all kinds of names. Um, and then when I first came to New York, I was 17 years old. That's when I started getting kind of transvest, more like a transvestite. I started out with makeup in 1963, 1964. And in 1965, I was coming out more. And I was still wearing makeup but I was still going to jail just for wearing makeup. 
1969, I started wearing female attire full time. Usually I wear a short dress every day of the week. I just don't put on much makeup or anything until after dark because it draws too much attention. If I were to wear a lot of makeup in the daytime, they might think that I was a male. But if I wear little makeup, they think I'm a female and they just let me ride on by. And if I wear a lot of makeup at night, they automatically know I'm female. They really can't tell the difference about me because I'm on my way to be a sex change. I have hormone treatments and my bust is uh, about uh, a small, it's a small bust, but it's a nice handful. And they feel that nice handful and they automatically go into the illusion that I might be real. From going into hormones, I've gotten so that I, I kind of, kind of dislike heterosexual men. And if I was to marry a male, it would strictly be a gay male because I don't care if a heterosexual man is a husband. They're too, they're too, uh, I can't think of the word, but it's too masculine they're for me. They're too oppressive. Be, a, be more realistic about it. I could always talk like a woman. I could always act like a woman. I could always do things that women would do because I was raised by my mother. Like I could wash, I could iron, I could cook, I could sew. I can, um... That's very oppressive Well, that's what they're good for doing. Ooh, stop. That's what no, women do. That's that. what my mother always did. Well, some women don't do that, but my mother was poor. She had to do it all herself. I, as a person, don't believe that a transvestite or a woman should do all the wash and do all the cooking and do everything that was forced on by the bourgeois society and the establishment that women have to do this. I don't believe in that. That's all a lot of baloney. If, if you have a lover or you have a friend that you really care for, you split everything down 50-50. If you don't feel like doing it, you just don't do it. Let him do it. Because this is what we're all trying to get across. Men are oppressive. They, are, they just oppress you in all different ways. All transvestites have a, a, a very feminine image. Some of it is a, a Marilyn Monroe type of sex spot. Some of it is a motherly figure. And mine was a fashion model. <laughs> Girls have always told me that uh, they have trouble at night, men bother them. We and, uh, do too. Uh, well, I, 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 I never <laughs> believed them until I went out in the street and drag for the first time. And the first time uh, I decided to be best at night, when? people couldn't see me very clearly. I went out and um, men start following me and they make lewd remarks to me in my ear. And I got so scared. Are. I've met many of men through my hustling experiences that were transvestites but were married. They were supposed to be heterosexual male. At this time, like, I would be dressed in unisex clothes and flamboyant hairstyles and makeup and the whole bit, you know, and they would come up and proposition me. And I was, you know, they would like to wear my female clothing uh, or either go with me to a store and help them shop so they can come to my house and I show them how to dress and put on the makeup and whatnot. They would just get their kicks, their, their sexual satisfaction by being in female clothing. Like, I never knocked them, I just said, well, I just don't understand it. I knew a person that was female impersonator on stage, transvestite, and she was forced into coming out to the public and saying, well, I'm a heterosexual male, not a homosexual. I think what, I think if these men would get their heads together and start facing this, and it's really beautiful because it's like the same thing a homosexual transvestite has to go through with telling their family. Like, my grandmother completely freaked out for a number of years until she just recently has to be satisfied that I'm, that I'm going to be my way. And then now she calls me Sylvia, I'm her dear granddaughter, I'm all this, you know. Society keeps on saying, you can't do this because this isn't your role. Who is to tell who what role we're supposed to take? I was at a demonstration um, when the gay people um, charged um, the United States with genocide. And this person wrote 
a paragraph or more, you know, short thing on when we, the street people and transvestites appeared on the scene. So right away he throws everything on me and he starts off, Mr. Ray Rivera. Mr. Rivera likes to be called by his transvestite friends as Sylvia. This is very oppressive. I, everyone calls me Sylvia. My name is, I, my, I've had this name for nine years. Straight or gay, even on my job, the girls that I used to, the women that I used to work with called me Sylvia. And like, it's not just transvestites that call me Sylvia or consider me or treat me as she. They, this is what, people respect you. This is respect. Like, um, Marsha was written up in the same article. A black male transvestite. Why does he have to say what you're going to just say transvestite? Do not, it's that, not he, or if he doesn't want to put down she. Because I think what you would call it, if he's going to write, he shouldn't classify people. Just say transvestite, um, um, the transvestite brigade showed up or whatever. But he did very wrong, like, um, to, to classify people like me as Mr. Ray Rivera. Because, like, um, he knows me from Gay Activist Alliance when I first joined there, like, um, I was there when GA first started, four months, when it was four months old. And like, um, I was, I made a phone call from Josie. I said, do you accept transvestites? At that time, I was still using the word drag queen. I said, do you accept drag queen? Sure, come on down. So my friends and I took down there to the meeting from Josie. And we walk in, we took a peek. He was nothing but butch male homosexuals that always oppressed transvestites. And we were very flamboyant with the makeup and everything. You know, tipping in, you know, really looking beautiful. So, like, we walked away, we walked up the block, and we came back, and we peeked in some more. <laughs> and we said, no, let's go home. We walked about five blocks and said, no, let's go in and freak them out for the hell of it. So we walked in, and I come, um, what's your name? At the table, you had to write your name. I said, my name is Sylvia. He says, what is your name? I said, I'm Sylvia. He says, well, we can't accept that name. <laughs> so I wrote down Sylvia Lee Rivera in parentheses. I have the habit of putting Ray Rivera, my real name. <laughs> even butch identify, uh, even men, you know, homosexual males that are dealing with their sexism are always discriminating against transvestites. Because like, they just can't, that, we're threatening their masculinity. This is the way they feel. I would never go. I would never. I've never been to bed with a woman. I've never. I would never marry one. I've never considered even the sport. But I, as a person, could never see myself going to bed with a woman. <laughs> oh, sorry. Women terrify me as far as that goes. I'm sorry. I'm being realistic. I'm, I'm actually like I. I'm. I love to be around women. I can't I stand to be in a room full of males because they get me uptight. I get very uptight. Like, you know, they look at me and like, you know, I get very uptight. And like, um, w women are more free, you know, like they understand. A woman seems to understand because you're gay and you're a transvestite. They understand you more than a male does and they won't ridicule you that much. I'm dealing with my own, with my own problems. Like, self-discipline is like um, trying to deal away with using the term Miss Thing or drag queen. Like, before when he called me Miss Thing, I had to hit him because I don't like it. Mary, we got to get rid of that. It's, it's, it's very oppressive. Do you ever go to um, drag balls? I've been to two. I don't like drag balls. I don't believe that, like, I'm, I don't believe in competition. I like everything there's competing against each other. It is, like, if you feel you should have won the first prize, the first trophy, grand prize, these, these break into fights. All this violence, like what you call it. I believe in fighting violence, but got to go out and beat up a pig or something, but don't beat up your sisters for, for the reason because you thought you made a better gown than she did, that you should have this trophy. Both Sylvia and Marsha remained very visible participants in the battle for equal rights in New York City. They're remembered today as iconic and pioneering trans activists. Marsha P. Johnson died in 1992. She was 46. Sylvia Rivera died 10 years later. 
at the age of 50. To learn more about their lives and Star House, have a listen to Making Gay History's three episodes featuring my 1989 interviews with Sylvia and Marcia. Many thanks to everyone who makes Making Gay History possible. Senior producer Nahani Rouse, producers Josh Gwynn and Andre Bolito, deputy director Inga Detaya, audio engineer Jeff Town, photo editor Michael Green, and our social media team, Christiana Pena, Nick Porter, Daniel Lorenko, and Will Coley. Special thanks to Jenna Weiss Berman and our founding editor and producer, Sarah Burningham. Our theme music was composed by Fritz Myers. A big thank you to our researcher, Brian Faree, for unearthing the star interview you just heard, and to Liza Cowan, who recorded it back in 1970. After her stint at WBAI, Liza went on to write for Cowrie Magazine and later became editor and publisher of Dyke, a quarterly. Today, she's an artist and graphic designer. You can find her work at smallequals.com. Making Gay History is a co-production of Pineapple Street Studios with assistance from the New York Public Library's Manuscripts and Archives Division and the One Archives at the USC Libraries. This podcast has been made possible with funding from the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation, the Calamus Foundation, Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS, the Small Change Foundation, Irwin and Andrew Press, and our listeners, including Rob Darrow. Thanks, Rob. Stay in touch with Making Gay History by signing up for our newsletter at makinggayhistory.com. Our website is also where you'll find previous episodes, archival photos, full transcripts, and additional information on each of the people and stories we feature. So long, until next time.